Hello everyone. This is a week six preview video. So just for two seconds of background here, what's happening in the early 20th century, things that we've already talked about that we see continuing on. Uh, industrialization, urbanization, and now modernization. We've been in, talking about pre-modern diet. Uh, for the entire class up, into, up until now. And now we're very squarely, especially Atwater, you can kind of see as a transition figure from pre-modern thinking to modern thinking. His work with chemistry and other people are doing uh, nutritional research in terms of chemistry at this time, especially in Germany in the 18, late 60s, 1870s. So Atwater is kind of this transition from European centers of, of nutritional knowledge to uh, US research. And it looks a lot more like what we would consider to be science. It looks more like the way we produce knowledge about diet and health. These three sources that we're looking at this week, um, I think it's, it's, we could have sort of divided these up over the next few weeks, but I think looking at them all at the same time is actually really beneficial. We read about things that we haven't really gotten to in the course. So you'll read a little bit in Kellogg and especially in McCollum Wednesday and Friday, you'll read about vitamins, which we haven't seen. We have a whole week just on the development of vitamins and, and what that looks like. So we're getting a little ahead of ourselves uh, with that. And then also in Lulu Peter's book for, for today, for Monday, we'll also um, look at the importance of slim bodies and this sort of abhorrence of fat uh, which is a kind of inefficiency in a way. You're overeating. That's wasteful, just like Atwater and the New England Kitchen, Ellen Richards were talking about last week. So we'll get to that sort of idea about you know low fat and American diet in, in two weeks. So we're kind of seeing things a little bit out of order, but to see them all happening at the same time, 1818, or sorry, 1918, 1920, 21, 22, that's when all these books first appeared. Uh, one other sort of new thing to, to think about in terms of these texts, they're, I've mentioned you know, they're all written within a few years of each other. That in itself is new. When you think about pre-modern dietary advice, it tends to be pretty monolithic. There tends to be, uh, and the way Cheney was talking about diet is the way pretty much all, again, this is the Western European tradition, but it's the way that most physicians talked about diet. And we looked at Graham as a health reformer. Obviously, he has a particular moral and social agenda. He's talking about uh, diet in a way that was quite common for the time. Galen obviously had a long run of being sort of the person to follow. But now we're starting to see very different ways, right? Kellogg has kind of this sort of pseudo, not pseudo-scientific, but semi-scientific, semi-moral component as, as kind of like Graham did. Uh, Lulu Peters is very much sort of this popular writer writing for women in particular and trying to understand what they want and, and respond to what she saw women's needs were at the time needs and so of course her vision and uh and we see in mccollum this attention to very sort of diehard nutritional research which we still see today of course so very different strands that are all becoming kind of coming into their own in terms of ways in which people are interested in diet okay a little bit about the authors lulu hunt peters she lived 1870 to 1930-ish, uh, got her medical degree from University of California in 1909. For a number of years, she wrote a featured newspaper column called Diet and Health, and it was distributed to 400 plus newspapers around the country, so very wide distribution. And she kind of took a lot of that advice from the newspapers and encapsulated that into this book that we're reading also called Diet and Health, but the subtitle is revealing as well for us, with a key to the calories. And she was one of the first sort of best-selling diet authors um, that we really can identify, and certainly one of the first to popularize the idea of counting calories as a way of, of dieting, or as she calls it, reducing. So it's kind of like modern Weight Watchers, which was really incredibly popular for a long time and is still ongoing, obviously. So Peters is writing in the, in the in 1918, I think is when the first edition comes out. And she's writing um, as more people are getting more familiar with the idea of the calorie and micronutrients and um, uh, proteins and carbohydrates and the things that Atwater was talking about. So when she got her medical degree in the 19 aughts, uh, 1909 is when she got it, but her training would have been in that, in that the end of the 19, 
uh, the first part of the 1900s, uh, that would have been slowly working its way into the medical curriculum, which you can imagine changes kind of slowly. So a lot of the Atwater stuff that we saw was filtering into how physicians were being trained. And she comes from that you know, first or maybe second wave of physicians being trained in that new kind of nutrition. And she's writing this not as a physician, really, but as kind of a modern woman who's telling other modern women what they should do. Directed towards women, very obviously, if you've taken a look at it, uh, extremely popular, sold over two million copies, uh, I think, carried out in, in multiple editions. If you look at the first couple pages of the one that we're looking at, and we're not looking at the first edition, I think it's the 14th or 15th edition that we're looking at. It's coming out in two or three editions per year, and it's not changing much, but it shows you the popularity. There's a, you can't print enough copies, right? And selling two million books in 1918 is, is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, the book was really popular in the early 20s and then started to kind of decline in 26, in, in part because so many other diet books were coming onto the market as well. But its impact went well beyond, as you might imagine. Uh, we saw how Atwater was trying to make nutritional information more accessible to a layperson using common language and so on, and uh, analogy and metaphor and kind of talking of, in terms of things and processes that people would already understand, right? And even trying to explain technical things. You see Lulu Peters doing that same thing, right? Uh, in, a, in a completely different way. Like you don't read Peters and think, oh, this person is an established biochemist, as you might think with Atwater. Um, but she also has this sort of rhetorical style that's very attractive to her readers, right? It's very homey. It's very empathetic. It's also very motherly. Like, here's what you need to be doing. The book is about reducing which we call dieting, obviously. American women were becoming interested at the time in a new kind of slim body, getting away from some of the more unbalanced, bulkier kinds of things from the late 19th century. We'll get to more of that in, in a couple of weeks, as I mentioned. Fashion is changing, art movements, Art Nouveau movement. World War I is sending more women out into the, into the workplace. This is, happens to a much greater extent in World War II, which you're probably familiar with, but even in World War I, the US didn't join the war until 1917. So uh, it wasn't as prevalent in the US as it was in Europe. Women are being more active. They're, have, they're wearing clothes that are more um, you know, oriented towards movement and doing things. Women's suffrage is in 1920. So women are outside the home more and they're more publicly visible. And we can't get into all the details of this, but this is very significant because the body then, the physical body, becomes partly a marker of, of social status. And uh, you're, you know, there's an expectation to be thin or to be look a certain way. And what's in vogue at the time is, is the slimness, a certain kind of figure, a certain kind of efficiency to your own body. And it's, it's something of a status marker, right? You are morally superior if you look a certain way obviously an attitude that we're all still familiar with and, and battling in the modern world uh, the contemporary world that the discipline for looking a certain way or having a certain kind of body the discipline required echoes what we saw in Graham very closely right and the uh, the efficiency of not eating too much and carrying extra weight. The text reads very differently than stuff we've seen, but you can see there's also these threads of, of continuity as well. On Wednesday, we run into John Harvey Kellogg. You're familiar with his serial. The, the signature you see on the box, uh, Kellogg, it's actually his brother's signature who took off of the business. Um, in very sort of hostile ways. They didn't talk to each other the last 30 years of their life or so. Uh, so a kind of an unhappy story there. They got into an argument about whether they should put sugar in their cereal, which is not insignificant because part of what John Kellogg, who the person we're reading, is talking about health reform and uh, what you should be putting in your body, very similar to Graham, in the sense he didn't want any kind of stimulation and, and so on. So John Kellogg, uh, 1850s to 1940s, was a health reformer. These, these dates are just for vague reference. You're not going to get tested on this. Very similar to Graham in, in some ways, very different in others. Similarities include um, religious sort of backgrounds. He's a Presbyterian uh, minister. Um, sorry, Graham was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, Kellogg was a Seventh-day Adventist. 
Like Graham, Kellogg was an influential leader in progressive health reform. He called his approach um, biologic living, and it was a lot like following natural law, which you'll see in the text on Wednesday. It doesn't reference it quite as overtly as Graham and other texts that I, I looked at last week do, uh, but it's there. It's very clear. And he uses, like Graham, he uses science, scientific principles, scientific methods, and just kind of the mantra of science in general to justify his Adventist beliefs, uh, promoting health reform through diet, particularly vegetarianism, but also temperance and abstinence from alcohol and, and anything that's overstimulating, like sugar, tea, coffee, tobacco, and so on. Key differences, Graham was a tremendously gifted public speaker, as we've read about. Kellogg used other means, uh, notably text, like one we're reading. Uh, he wrote a lot of other things as well. He uh, was director of, uh, not long after it was founded, became the director of the Battle Creek, Battle Creek Sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan, founded by other members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And sanitaria at the time were places you would go for health. I mean, that's literally what the word means. Sanitarium is place of health. And you would get out of the city. This was for wealth in general. They were for wealthier people. They kind of they started in Europe, but then also spread to uh, upstate New York, very sort of idyllic uh, country, and then into the Midwest and some in the South and, and kept moving westward. Uh, New Mexico, uh, Santa Fe and, and Albuquerque were, were centers, especially for tuberculosis treatment, uh, very influential. Uh, to the development of our own city here, but then also in California, Texas, um, and kind of moved moved westward until they sort of went away after the railroads kind of went away. Uh, anyway, that cities were becoming dirty, they were becoming crowded, they were kind of getting a reputation for being filthy. So if you could afford it, you could take time out of your life and pay to go stay at a sanitarium, a nice idyllic countryside, uh, restore your health through clean air, sunshine, light exercise, and so on. Not surprisingly, diet was a big part of recovering health at the sanitarium, especially through eating clean food, right? Nothing stimulating. Uh, and this is one reason we get cereals, because he invented it to feed to his patients at, at, at his sanitarium. Uh, incidentally, the, the key development in, in cereal isn't the rolling out of the flakes, as you might kind of expect. Other people were doing similar things, but the, the key invention was soaking it beforehand because it made it palatable. The original cereal called granula was really, really hard. If you've ever eaten grape nuts, it's kind of the modern equivalent, but it, grape nuts are actually chewable, whereas original cereal was, was not. You had to soak it in milk or cream for 20 minutes before you could even eat it, which is... Like, that's pretty hard cereal. It's important to mention, we're not going to get into this aspect of Kellogg, but it's important to mention because it aligns with so many things we're, other, we're talking about the last two weeks. Kellogg dedicated the last, the last third of his life uh, to promoting eugenics and uh, founded the Race Betterment Foundation, I think it's called, uh, which promoted the sterilizing um, mentally defective people or mentally defective persons is the phrase. And he did this as a member of the Michigan Board of Health. And so you see a way that someone well-respected as a physician is advocating for a, a pretty um, extreme form of, of social reform, right? Sterilizing people that he didn't think were smart enough, right? Or had some other problem. We don't want those people, you know, populating the world. And it's another example uh, of using science and data for social good, except that the, you know, Things that you can make into objective measurements, like you can quantitatively measure someone's intelligence and you get some arbitrary number, but then other people with very subjective agendas, not objective ones, decide what that number means and what the cutoff is for smart or not smart or able to reproduce or, or not. Our last author for this week, Elmer McCollum, uh, 1880 to, to 1967 roughly, uh, was not a physician, but a biochemist, and in this case, more like Atwater, known for his work studying the relationship between diet and health on a very chemical level. So uh, Atwater is really looking at what we call macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, their relationship to each other. McCollum is really interested in uh, vitamins, for one. He discovers the first vitamins, A and D and B, but he's also interested in sort of, you know, magnesium and manganese and zinc and like trace elements that we need in our diet 
uh, or cause very spe specific diseases. He started his nutritional research at the University of Wisconsin, and he was initially trying to understand why cows fed with corn seemed healthier and more robust than cows fed with just oats or, or, or wheat. And uh, in the process of trying to understand uh, why, he realized cows are really poor subjects for nutritional research because they're really slow. And they don't reproduce very fast. They, they eat a lot. You need a lot of food. It's hard to really study what's happening on a cow. So he went uh, into some barns and trapped some rats and started the first rat colony for nutritional research. And it turned out that the, the barn rats were too feral. They were just like going crazy in the lab and uh, maybe they were dangerous. I don't know the exact story, but he got rid of those and bought some albino rats uh, at a store. And then that became the seed of a, the first rat colony used for nutritional research, which is obviously along with mice, something we still do. Uh, and it's a point of tension that we do a lot of our nutritional research in terms of what does food do to the body. We study it through these other animals, which, you know, obviously people know they're not the same, but, you know, how much that translates and, and carries over to people is an ongoing question. He and his colleagues discovered the first vitamin, which was uh, cleverly named factor A, becomes vitamin A and B and D and other things and, and the trace elements. He wrote, as Peters did in a very different style, um, a column called Our Daily Diet. This is between 1922 and 46. Uh, and he, he wrote about 160 columns, uh, articles for McCall's magazine. McCall's is one of the top five or top three women's magazines in the country. And it was really a fashion magazine. And uh, it has a really fascinating history. Um, and the fact that he's writing there in this fashion magazine for you know upper class women, telling them the importance of these you know vitamins and these other trace elements. He's not explaining chemistry to them in the same way, but he's explaining why it's important that they know about these invisible things, these elements that are in our food that we need to have to thrive in our health. And so it underscores the importance of domestic science and home economics that we saw in the New England kitchen, largely in the Bitlikoff reading for Wednesday. We see him educating women, a particular set of women within society, but what kinds of foods are crucial for their family's health. Enough background on the authors. We could you know, obviously spend a lot of time on that, but that's good enough for now. I want to say a little bit more about what are you supposed to do with these sources. Um, first of all, these are all from 1920-ish, right? Don't worry about whether anything in these texts is, is right or not. It, it just it doesn't matter. So, for example... Lulu Peters writes in chapter two, it's in the first few pages, I think. Mental work does not require added nourishment, she says. False. Like, it totally does, right? If you've ever done a lot of thinking, you get tired because your brain is using a ton of energy. It's using basically raw sugar. It's not the same as running where your muscles are converting, you know, energy to something they can use it obviously works differently in your brain, but it's using a lot of energy. Mental work requires added nourishment, full stop. There's no question about it. You could spend your whole post writing about how the advice in one source or the other is wrong or why it's wrong. It doesn't matter that it's wrong. Everyone we've read has been right in some ways and wrong in some other ways. That's just the way it is. So let's just get over that and not worry about it. The point of reading these uh, is to understand for us in this class, to understand why they made sense at the time. Why did these authors write this way? What can we learn about American diet and health in the early 20th century from these texts? Be sure you're familiar with the primary source reflections that are on the, the syllabus. I'll, I wanna riff on that just for a second. Um, you want to think about a couple of sort of related questions. And again, these are already written down, so you don't have to you know, take notes on, 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 on me saying it right now. Why is the author writing this? What, what is their major beliefs about diet, health, society that are motivating them to write this? Right? This is the question we've been talking about in almost all the sources so far. So it should be 
pretty common questions that you're familiar with. But that's what I want you to be thinking about as you're reading these texts. Well, what is the author doing? And sometimes you'll find things in the preface and introduction that say, I'm writing this because, okay, that's a good hint. But there's probably other stuff that's there that isn't as obvious. Okay, so, so read between the lines. Who is the audience? Who are they writing to? What does the, audi what does the author think their intended audience knows? or doesn't know and needs to know. How do answers to these kinds of questions look a little differently f with these books or with the one you're reading for a particular day compared to other stuff that we've read? Most importantly, what does the book you're reading tell us about American diet and health in the early 20th century? Now, it's not going to tell us everything. That's why we're reading three books over the week because they all tell us something different. But for the one you're looking at, what does it tell us? And it, what's new about that? What's, what have we kind of seen before? What's a, a variation on a theme? What seems to be an innovation? What anything seems to be kind of just imported from you know, one era, Graham or Atwater into the early 20th century. Okay, last advice. As you read, look at the rhetoric. Look at, not just in terms of the dietary advice. When I say look at the rhetoric, it's not just about what do they say in terms of diet. It's how do they say it? How would you characterize the language? Is it very objective and scientific and precise as you might categorize Atwater? Is it, is it more sort of empathetic and, and emotional as you might relate to, to Cheney? Is it a combination that we kind of saw in Graham? What's the style like? What's the tone like? Look at the general content to see what the book is about. Okay, I've given you some pages and some sections to read specifically because I think they're really important for that book. That's that's the that's not even the minimum. Okay, you you need to look at that for sure. I just want to make sure you don't miss those things. But your assignment with these texts is to get familiar with the whole thing. Okay, it's to have a broad familiarity over the whole text. So just kind of sample here and there. You don't need to spend a ton of time with it, but you do need to look at the table of contents carefully. You do need to sort of click at, through different sections to get a sense of the language, to get a sense of the topics, to get a sense of how the author makes an argument or tries to convince someone. Obviously, we could have you know hours of lectures about the historical background in the early 20th century and, what, and what's going on, and I, I wish we could do more. But part of the fun of looking at these texts is letting the text speak for themselves rather than me totally coloring your perception of, of what you're reading. I, I want you to explore it and try to answer these questions about what can this text tell us about diet and health and come to your own conclusions about it. So obviously what we're doing in this class is kind of building this textual tradition up over time in, in ways that I see the strands over time sort of coming together for our modern you know contemporary diet and discourse that we have around us uh, every day. So have fun. I'll talk to you later.